96.5 CTG. Alan Barnes here with the original 70s soundtrack, and we have on the line with us tonight Mr. Al Stewart. How you doing, Al? I'm fine. How about you? Good, good. We're talking to Al. I believe you're in California right now. Is that correct? Yes, I'm in Los Angeles at the moment. For those listeners who don't know, obviously our, we're a 70s show, and most of our listeners, their, their point of entry, uh, their contacts that they know Al Stewart from is obviously going to be Year of the Cat, Time Passages, uh, Gosh, On the Border, um, Song on the Radio, great hits like that. But we, we want to sort of take you back for our listeners to the early part of your career from the folk singing in, uh, in Great Britain. So in, in the early days, I think I'd read a quote that uh, your, your sort of professional goal was, your, your first aspiration was to be the British Bob Dylan. Well, I, I, it was a strange time. I, 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 I played in, when I was a teenager, I played in lots of uh, kind of Beatle cover bands and things, and um, uh, all the, all the you know, pop hits of the early and mid-60s. And um, I, I wasn't really very good at it. I mean, the, the thing that really mattered in those days was to play the guitar really well. And you had, you know, Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton and, and Jeff Beck and people like that. Um, and um, I, I suppose if I'd have really stuck at it and worked very hard, I might have become the, oh, I don't know, 27,164th best guitar player in Britain. <laughs> but it didn't um, didn't seem to be much of a future. But when Bob Dylan came along, you know, he, you know his thing was writing lyrics. Um, and I could do that a lot more easily than I could ever learn how to play the guitar. I think there were only about 10 people in England at the time who really cared, you know what I mean? I mean, nobody was, was bothering to write write lyrics. So I, I said, you know what? If I do this, you know, even if I'm the worst lyric writer in England, I'll, I'll still be the 10th best. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. uh, so um, I, basically, I, I, after seeing Jimi Hendrix one night, I actually sold my electric guitar because I thought, I'll never do that if I live to be a million, you know. Um, and I kind of immersed myself in... Um, you know, reading French existentialist novels and history and what have you, and eventually you know, turning it all into songs. I mean, I really wanted to, well, I suppose when I was 17, I wanted the same thing everybody wants. You know, I wanted to be in a band that had a top 10 hit, I, but I, I was never really very good at, um, I mean, I loved the music, I just wasn't good at it, you know. Um, and then when Dylan came along, I thought, whoa, you know, hey, I think I can do this. So. <laughs> sure. Maybe right. that's what I meant to do, you know. And speaking of great guitar players, I think early in your career, you got signed, um, and uh, as you were doing, uh, gosh, late 60s, uh, one of the big session players at the time, uh, sort of anonymously, was Jimmy Page. Yeah, yeah I, that Jimmy's on about, he's on a couple of my early albums, I think. I met him when he played on the B-side of my first single, and he, he, that was before Zeppelin. I probably should have paid attention, because of what he said to me at that session um, was that he was forming a band and they were looking for a bass player. And he actually looked at me quite meaningfully at the time. I just oh, let no. it go. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, the best of luck, you know, which, which in retrospect probably is, um, wasn't the right answer. I'd also seen a, a, a little blurb, too, that for some period of time, and I didn't even realize Paul Simon lived in, in Great Britain, but, but you were roomies with him at one time. Uh, yeah. Um, there was a flat in the east end of London where folk singers used to stay. I was 19 and I you know, just came up to London and um, went and lived there for four months and that was where Paul stayed when he came to England. Um, so he arrived and, and you know, started playing, started writing songs in the room next to me. I mean, I could hear him write you know, these things through the wall. I mean, he, wow. he came out and played Richard Curry to me one day. He'd just written it and I said, that's fantastic. That's really great. And he came out and played Homeward Bound the next day and I said, oh, that's not as good. You should, you should throw that one away and keep <laughs> Richard Curry. So, so I don't think I knew anything at all. And then Archie Garfunkel came over, and um, I think he'd sort of given up music at that point, and Art was going to be a, uh, a mathematician, I think. And of course, as all the world knows, um, Tom Wilson at Columbia Records overdubbed uh, guitar, bass, and drums on the original version of Sounds of Silence that had only an acoustic guitar on it, and it went to number one. So <laughs> right. that changed their lives completely. Art gave up mathematics, and um, they got on a plane and went back and became the stars that they are today. Did you did you go through any of that? I mean, you, you got signed, I guess, somewhere along the way, and you became a, a tribute. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we're talking 65. I was really, you know, I, 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 did, I didn't know anything. I didn't know it. It took a, yeah, eventually I, I got a record deal, um, as it happens, with, with the same label that Dylan and Paul were on. It was just, uh, Columbia Records, CBS in England. So, and then again in the 60s, I guess, uh, the thing that's interesting about then versus now is your career was sort of allowed to simmer a bit in that uh, you, you charted a little more growth with each release, um, whereas these days, if you're, not, if you're not selling big units right off the bat, you're pretty much done. Yeah, I mean, they let me make, I, mean, I have no idea why they let me make six records before I ever had a hit, and we're talking albums. Uh, and it's true that each one did sell a little more than one before, but um, 
I, I don't know. I mean, in those days, you could do that, I think. I, I, I think, I, you know, CBS Records, every, every, all the big labels had a Pat Folk singer, you know what I mean? And, right. um, you know, every year or two, I'd come in with, a, with you know, with the tapes of a new album, and they'd stamp it out. But I don't think they ever made a, a huge effort to sell them. Um, but it, as you say, because I played so many live shows, it, it, you know, it began to develop its own momentum. And, and by the time we got to the sixth one, which was Modern Times, it actually made the, the top 30 both in England and in America, which was, um, I thought, was about as far as it was going to go. <laughs> but even before that, I mean, Love Chronicles, uh, it's a dubious distinction, but that was the first mainstream record to uh, include the unbeeped version of the F word. Yeah, but I was using the present participle rather than the four-letter version that um, everyone... I was using it in its proper sense, too. But yes, I, I probably was the first person to do that. But in a sense, we can blame you for Eminem. Um, in a sense, <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> We've no one to blame anyway, ourselves M&M, for that. <laughs> Eminem seems to be doing very well, so I, I don't... We, yeah, well, it, it's, um, I, I, the language has sort of loosened up a little bit, uh, so against that backdrop, though, is that what your inspiration was to, to, to go even in a completely different direction and get known for writing these, like, historical opuses? Or, Well, I mean, it's as much about language as it is about content. I mean, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I love Yakety Yak. I mean, I couldn't write it because I didn't come from that background, but I would have loved to have done it. Um, but it, 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 there's not a lot of difference to me between that and, say, Desolation Row. It, it's just, you know... Uh, it, it's, it's the, the difference is stylistic, but that you still have you know great originality and then just wonderful turns of phrase. You know, we were we were talking about. I think you mentioned Modern Times a little while ago. Was that your first uh, Alan Parsons produced record? Yeah, it was. That's right. Yes. Yeah. How did that come about? Was that a pairing that your record company did, or did you express an interest? No, I, I knew Alan from. Um, God, I don't know where I met him now. Come to think of, I think we was. I, I remember I was sitting in a restaurant with him in 1974. And um, I had to, you know, it was time to make a new record. And and the conversation, I think, was no more than about seven seconds. I said, oh, I'm making a new album. Would you like to produce it? And he said, oh, yes, I I suppose I could do. And then we went on and talked about something else. And that's all all there was to it. (laughs) Wow. And we went on to make three records together. Did you get the sense that, I mean, you know, sometimes revisionist history is such that in context... uh, you know, I'm working with this man who's absolutely a. Pro- I mean, he, he's considered pretty much in the production world a genius. Damn right, were you in sort of awe of that? It's like, oh my gosh, this guy just did Dark Side of the Moon, and now he's on my record. Or, well, it, it, we did two completely different things. Um, one of the reasons why I think it works was um, worked was because um, Alan was, um, to say the least, fastidious about about production. I mean, everything had to be doubled and quadrupled, and uh, I would sit there for hours on end playing, you know, guitar parts one on top of another to make the acoustic you know, guitar sound fat, which I'd never done before. I had no idea that, that was how you did it. We, we had our own areas of expertise, and, uh, we, you know, we both got on with what we did best and, you know, kind of left each other alone to do it. When, when you did Year of the Cat, and, and we, we've talked to a lot of different people, and, and it's always interesting to people sort of get the sense that uh, I think we all know what it's like to be number one on the charts or have a top ten hit in this day and age because you see it coming because you can watch it grow with sounds can't you have up to the minute data but I mean back then it, when you find out you have a top 10 hit you know we picture like your manager running down the aisle of a tour bus holding up the la- latest copy of Billboard and that's when you find yeah, out. Yeah that's pretty much how it was um, unfortunately the I remember the, of course because you do um, the day that it went into the top 10 and the main reason I remember because I was in Kentucky and I was staying in a Holiday Inn. I came down at 11 o'clock in the morning to, to be greeted with the news that my record was in the top 10, which, of course, was wonderful. Um, and I went into the restaurant, which was completely deserted at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I said, can I have breakfast? I want some, some eggs. And they said, no, you can't, because we stopped serving them at 10.30. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, what, but I'm, looking, I'm looking around the restaurant. There's no one in the restaurant, you know, like I'm... Um, it just, yeah, and I said, well, you know, what will it take to get me some eggs? And you're like, can I pay you double? You know, I mean, I mean, leave you a big tip. And I'm not terribly sorry, sir. It's against our policy to serve eggs after 10 30. So I'm in this situation where my record has just gone into the top 10. If I was in Los Angeles, I could have anything I like. In Kentucky, it didn't mean anything. I mean, no one wow. cared. I eventually, I got, I managed to talk them into a, I don't know, one of these miniature packets of cornflakes, and they begrudgingly gave me some milk, and, and that, that was how I celebrated my arrival in the top ten. <laughs> but even if they didn't know the name, they would have had to have known the song. I mean, if it, if it were me in that situation, I just would have said, now hold on a second, I would have said, in the morning from a Bogart movie, 
in a country yeah, where I mean, I, 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 back yeah. time, you know, just I'm, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I, it did cross my mind to just put a hundred dollar bill on the table and say, make yeah. me some eggs, but <laughs> <laughs> make me some eggs. But, um, it. <laughs> but you just can't get, you know, I mean, it, right. it's, it's interesting because you think if you, you know, like, uh, temporarily a pop star or something, you have some sort of control over your environment. And I discovered that because I spent the, the whole of the time it was in the top 10, I was on the road doing, uh, you know, one-nighters. And uh, it, it's quite remarkable outside of, you know, the actual gig where they pay attention. I mean, you you spend a lot of your time in the most mundane fashion trying to get your laundry done before you get to the next gig. I mean, just, you know, like, sort of, have I got a clean shirt? I mean, it, it's really weird because you, you read, you know, like stories of Led Zeppelin throwing televisions out of the, the you know, the, the window, the, actually it was the Who, I think. Um, and you think, God, you know, like, if I had a hit, I'd have all this rock and roll fun. My whole experience of the six weeks of the record was, you know, like in the top ten was, um, you know, entirely revolving around, like, kind of laundry and trying to get, you know, sort of, Lunch at well, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's not the rock and roll uh, Cinderella story. It, it, it had nothing to do with it. And, and of course, by the time I got back to Los Angeles, the record had fallen out of the top ten, and, and everyone had sort of basically forgotten about me. So I missed all the parties and all the um, all the hijinks, and it was just all work at that time. The, the song itself, though, it, it's amazing the legs that it, that it has. Uh, four legs, I guess, would be the joke. But I used to play deck bars in an acoustic solo set, and I would throw "You're the Cat" in there, and it always got such a good response. Well, that one stuck around. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's one of those things like, I don't know, white or shade of pale or whatever that refuses to go away. Um, which right. is, it's, it's kind of charming. I mean, I, I, I couldn't tell you why. I mean, I've written, well, I don't know, four or five hundred songs and we've recorded two hundred of them, and, and that seems to be the one that everyone has latched onto. Being on the radio side of things, too, especially then, we knew that uh, three, four minutes was tops, and, and you were still even in time passages. Uh, like Song on the Radio, for example, ran over six minutes in its unedited form. Um, yeah, they all run over six minutes. Yeah. I mean, I can't write short songs. I mean, well, occasionally I do, but I don't often write short songs. Um, it's, it's, it's Shakespeare said the brevity is the soul of wit, and obviously I'm I'm witless when it comes to this. You know? or, or soulless, <laughs> one or how you want to flip that coin. But all I could think of yeah. was, was the original lyrics, like, this song's too long to be played on the radio. And it was just like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You should do that. I won't charge you. So, so, what's the, so let's go get the flip side of that. So, okay, your, your trajectory is going up. And then time patches come out. That does well. That does well too. Uh, so, so what starts to happen when you when you see the chart stuff start slipping away? Does panic sit in? Because I mean, everybody has their has their era, and I don't think any of the big stars. I mean, no one's going to just stay in the top ten forever. Does it does it does it cause you like to second guess your direction, or you just keep on going? Or well, I think there are some you know really talented people who have great long careers, you know, you look at the Eric Clapton's, the Elton John's, what have you, um, the Paul Simons, the, the Bob Dylan's, um, and, and, but these are the exceptions to the rule, as you quite rightly say, I mean, there have probably been, I don't know what, 10,000 people who had a top 10 hit over the course of rock and roll, maybe more for all I know, and um, most of them have one hit, or, or maybe two at best, you know, it, it's right. just um, the way of the world, as you say, I think fashions and things move on. But I, I came into this as a folk singer, and, and you know, when I stopped um, making these pop hits, uh, I just went back to being a folk singer again. It was, it was, uh, it was actually what I did a lot better. I don't think I was terribly good uh, being an ersatz pop star. So um, to, to me, it was, it was perfectly fine to you know pick the acoustic guitar back up and then go out and do what I was doing before, which I'm still doing. I mean, I'm still doing a, you know, like a, a, a ton of gigs, uh, you know, but in the style that that, um, mm. that I did them for. Probably 43 out of the 45 years I've been doing this. There was a, a two-year gap in the middle where I had a band and saxophones and things, but that's not really what I do. I mean, it, it was a, sure. it was just like visiting another planet. You know? The interesting thing too is the is the economics of that. I think I'd read somewhere that you actually started making money on tours when you stripped it back down. When you sort of slimmed down your business organization, for lack of a better term, that's when you actually started making a, a decent living. Yeah, I didn't really make any money while I was having the hits. I mean, I think we broke even on, you know, for, say, from 74 to 82 or something like that. It was um, when I had the band. Uh, but it, it was just because of what you say. I mean, every time we went out on a tour, the tour would cost us, you know, we'd lose a quarter of a million bucks. And um, you subsidize it with record sales. So eventually, you know, you, if, if you break even, you're lucky. A lot of people actually don't break even. Coming coming around to now, speaking of, you're on tour with Dave Nachmanoff, and you did the Uncorked album uh, last year, the year before. Um, right. 
with with him some of the tour dates I see you have coming up for our East Coast listeners. Um, the one that's closest to our radio station is March the third at Ram's Head in Annapolis, which is a I don't know if you've ever played that venue before, but it's oh I've played that one about um, I don't know six seven eight times. So okay. I, mean, I do it every year. And uh, the other thing I, I got to get this in because of course I'm a guitar player too. Uh, um, I, and I'm a Taylor guy. I saw that that you're a Taylor uh, guitar player too. Uh, do you have a favorite model or? You know, I only have one guitar. I'm, I'm um, looks yeah. like an eight fourteen or a. It's it's an eight twelve C, I think. Okay. Um, I got Lawrence Juba got it for me. Um, in fact, it, 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 it it's a factory defect. It had a crack in it, so um, they gave it me incredibly cheap. And for some unknown reason, it's the only thing I can play because I can't play most guitars because the action's too high. This one has an action like a Fender Stratocaster. So. <laughs> yeah, Taylor guitars are magnificent. I was an Ovation guy before that, but uh, I. I have an Ovation too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't um, idolize guitars. I mean, I use them to uh, help compose song lyrics, really, which for me is what it's all about. So, uh, I mean, I like I like playing the guitar. I mean, it's great therapy, and um, it feels good, but uh, by no means a guitar player. It's not uh, my calling in life. You know? Well, I, well, don't sell yourself short either, because I think your guitar playing is coming a lot through a lot more uh, just within the two-man realm than when you were fronting the bigger band. Uh. Well, I, I could have had a, a ukulele around my neck with the band because you, could, because you couldn't hear it anyway, right. and it didn't, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't have made any difference. That was one of the things that was depressing, was that the, the, the sheer amount of noise that was generated got in the way of people hearing the words, you know. Um, oh, yeah. But, but it's, yeah, you get caught up in this um, sort of pop thing. Once you put a saxophone on a record, you know, if you, if you do a live date, people want to hear the saxophone, so then you need the bass and the drums and the guitar and the keyboards and the backing singers and, and the road crew and... <laughs> And now a saxophone player. Even <laughs> and, the, and the lights and the piano tuner. And the, we went to Japan, I think we had 28 people. It was easy to see how you can lose money doing this. You know? mm-hmm. um, it was just this vast organization that was, was trolling around uh, the world. You know, We were flying all over the world playing shows and uh, just hemorrhaging money, really. It was, uh, but everybody did it. I mean, everybody did the same thing at, the, at, at that time. Sure. Well, Mr. Al Stewart, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, like I say, we do 70s stuff on our show, so we keep your music front and center. Uh, we keep the pop hits going while you're out there uh, making a living on the road. And we're glad to see that uh, you're out there still doing it. Well, it's too late to take up professional basketball, really. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be, the, that'll be the, the, the quote of the interview, for sure. Okay. Well, thank you for being so generous with your time and having a great sense of humor. And again, we'll make sure that we let everybody know uh, to check you out on tour. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, have a good one. Okay, bye. Bye.